my colleagues across the House have mentioned in their contributions so far uh, the report from the IPCC, IPCC on Monday made for grim reading and it didn't tell us anything we don't know already. We are in a really dangerous situation uh, with respect to climate. The report was a hard scientific report. It was put together by people who know what they're talking about. They've looked at the numbers. They've been looking at this for 30 years. And the science is absolutely and categorically uh, true. We are in a perilous situation with respect to our climate. The report says that by 2025, global emissions, greenhouse gas emissions must peak. And then we must reduce them by about 47% by the end of the decade if we're to maintain any hope of staying within the 1.5 degree threshold that was set in the Paris Agreement. That's 1.5 degrees temperature rise over the pre-industrial average. The rate of growth of emissions has slowed to about 1.7% per year, and that is positive. But the chances of keeping to that temperature rise of 1.5 degrees now are very, very slim indeed. In actual fact, we're on for double that rise. We're on for three degrees and we're at about 1.2 degrees right now. With the 1.2 degrees that we're at right now, we can see across the world the devastation that it's causing. We can see it here in Ireland with droughts, uh, with very frequent storms, um, and we're seeing it more so across the world uh, where the global poor are affected most. Two degrees of warming we'll see sea levels rise by about 60 centimetres, about two feet. And beyond two degrees, and we're on course for three degrees, we don't know for sure just how bad that will be. But what will happen, what we do know, is that feedback loops will kick in and we will enter a chain reaction of global temperature rise that will be utterly catastrophic. It will lead to the global ice melt uh, exponentially accelerating. And that is a situation where many of the coastal cities of the world will be underwater. Much of the coastal communities uh, that we know now will be uninhabitable. And we're likely to see the collapse of ecosystems and our ability to produce food. That's the course we're on right now. What's before this house is what the Climate Change Advisory Council has proposed as a carbon budget. The Council is not a representative body, nor should it be. It is a collection of experts in the science of climate change, as well as experts best placed place to guide us in the transition away from a fossil fueled and carbon intensive economy. I want to commend Chair Mary Donnelly of the Climate Change Advisory Council, uh, who came into our committee, uh, colleagues will remember, who really is a steady hand in this area. Uh, a voice of reason, very measured, and I think uh, we owe a debt to Chair Donnelly for the work that she has done in uh, the Climate Change Advisory Council and in producing this carbon budget. I want to commend her colleagues also for their work. And I want to give particular praise to the Carbon Budget Subcommittee. And they came into us in the Joint Directors Committee on Environment and Climate Action. I'd like to name them all, but there were so many uh, that I would be here. I've used all my time, Kian Corla, but we were really, really impressed with their contributions to us. The Climate Change Advisory Council is required under the Climate Act, which this House overwhelmingly supported last summer, to produce three consecutive carbon budgets. And the first two are required to be aligned with the legally binding target that we cut greenhouse gas emissions in this country by 51% by 2030. So what is a carbon budget? It is a self-imposed ration on the amount of carbon we will release into the atmosphere. It's not a sectoral ceiling. These will come later. I note the minister's opening contribution that I think we're going to get them at the end of June. So that will be very interesting. And I think you're going to propose sectoral emission ceilings uh, for the various relevant sectors, transport, agriculture, industry, electricity generation, and so on. Um, and a debate, a necessary debate, should happen then about what those appropriate sectoral emission ceilings are. 
But this is the carbon budget. This is the five-year maximum allocation of carbon we will allow ourselves across our society uh, through to 2026. And then the second one is through to 2030. And then the third one, as proposed by the Council, is provisional through to 2035. Our challenge in the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Environment and Climate Action, which I chair, was to look at the proposal from the Climate Change Advisory Council and assess whether the proposal was appropriate, whether it was something we would endorse or reject, uh, or what did we have to say about it. And colleagues are here with me today. This, we undertook a very extensive process, uh, and I commend colleagues for coming back to uh, the Oireachtas early uh, uh, after the Christmas recess to do that work. Uh, and it was a very comprehensive piece of work. We invited in, as I said earlier, the Carbon Budget Subcommittee of the Climate Change Advisory Council. We invited in other eminent scientists, including Professor Anderson, who uh, Deputy Bacic referenced just a few minutes ago. We invited in the social partners uh, with representatives from each of the pillars. And we brought in officials from the relevant government departments that will be most responsible for ensuring that the carbon budgets are not exceeded. In the end, the budgets were endorsed by the Joint Oireachtas Committee, though not unanimously, and it was a difficult process. And I do have to say we are a very collaborative committee, uh, and each and every member of the committee works extremely hard and diligently, week in, week out, uh, and uh, people took their positions fairly and legitimately. But in the end, we did endorse the carbon budgets by a strong majority, uh, and I respect those who have different views. I very much welcome Sinn Féin's position today and Deputy O'Rourke uh, and Deputy Cronin beside him, whose contributions to the committee I value always. I'm a bit taken aback by your criticisms of the government, Deputy. Uh, it's a little bit unlike uh, your contributions on the committee, but I might come back to those later. Um, Labour are um, a party that has a reputation for constructive opposition and they're very serious about policy uh, and I think it is, uh, is a loss to the committee that we don't have a Labour representative on our joint or Octus Committee on Environment and Climate Action and I know we did try and make amends uh, and I hope, uh, we will, uh, I hope we will continue to see Labour engage very positively on the climate debate. Uh, Deputy Whitmore is here and I think although I don't want to preempt Deputy Whitmore's words, but Social Democrats are probably inclined to say that the carbon budget isn't good enough and should go further. Uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting your position, Deputy Whitmore. And uh, we don't have representatives from people for profit. Uh, Deputy Smith is a valued member of the committee. And uh, I expect that their position will be that we should have a, a more demanding carbon budget as well. What I would say, though, is that anyone who is saying that we shouldn't accept this carbon budget and that we should go further, I would challenge them to show exactly how we can do that. I think it's really important that we get beyond the rhetoric here and we start to speak in numbers because this is an incredibly demanding carbon budget. A moratorium on data centres is a legitimate position to hold. But how many megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent will that give us? Free public transport, again, a legitimate position to hold. But again, how many megatons? The Climate Act requires us to get down from around 60 megatons of emissions per year of carbon dioxide equivalent down to about 30 in the space of eight years. And it's a fact that stopping the construction of data centers or providing free public transport is all nice to say, but it's actually not going to do it. So if you're going to say we have to have a, a more demanding carbon budget, then show us your alternative carbon budget. Show us your alternative climate action plan and let us scrutinize it. Let us look at the numbers. And if you can show us, then I have to say that your credibility on the question uh, is in doubt. With respect to the Climate Action Plan, I, colleagues earlier mentioned the opportunity that Ireland has in Count Corla. I won't quote 
Robert Frost again, uh, but we are at a fork in the road in our energy policy in this country. We have a choice in the medium to long term to decide what our energy future is going to be. And voices in this house are calling for us to double down on how we did things in the past. LNG is not the future for Ireland. We have so much renewable energy off our coast particularly. If we are confident as a nation, if we really believe that we are world leaders, as we might be in the provision of data centers, we can be world leaders in rolling out renewable energy. And we need to hear that across this house, hear that ambition and that confidence. Uh, and the idea that we would fall back on fossil fuel technology, especially in light of what we've heard from the IPCC earlier in the week, is utterly ridiculous. We should not do it. There's an opportunity for Ireland, with the assistance of Europe, to become the global leader in development of floating offshore technology particularly, the development of not just green hydrogen technology, but a green hydrogen economy. It's a completely different type of economy. And that is what we need to do. And we need to learn the lessons of 50 years ago when we went through a similar energy crisis, the oil crisis. After the oil crisis, the countries of Europe looked at how they might secure their energy security. And some countries were brave and they were innovative and they developed the renewable industry, the energy industry that we know today. Ireland sat back and it built a coal-fired power station that has left us with a lot of the problems that we have today. Let's not make the same mistake again. Let's develop a renewable energy industry, a green hydrogen economy, and let's not be conservative. Let's become suppliers of green and clean energy to Europe as well as to meet our own needs. And I want to briefly, in the few minutes that I have remaining, just to speak about the carbon tax. It isn't the case that the carbon tax is the sole pillar of the government's climate policy. It is one important measure, and it's a very, very important one. It amounts to the increase amounts of one, uh, one uh, euro 50 per month for the average household. And this one euro 50 per month provides 20 euros per month for those who are on the fuel allowance. It provides 12 euros per month for those on the living alone allowance. 12 euros per month for those in receipt of qualified child payment. If we're serious about climate, then we need to get serious about the carbon tax. And while I welcome Sinn Féin's position in endorsing the carbon budget today, I'd like to see them change their position on the carbon tax because it is absolutely necessary uh, for us to achieve our climate targets. Thank you.